Good afternoon, everybody. My name is John Walsh. I'm with the Washington Office on Latin America. And it's my pleasure and honor um, with my co-sponsors of this side event to welcome you um, to regulating cannabis in accord with international law, options to explore. You'll see uh, at the table, everyone should have a, a report. Um, it's going to be the basis for much of uh, our remarks today, balancing treaty stability and change, interstate say modification of the UN Drug Control Conventions to facilitate cannabis regulation. Uh, mindful of the very limited time we have uh, and that there is an event coming here afterwards, I'm going to dispense with many of the formalities that would normally be uh, associated with the panels of this caliber, um, only to say in previous events at UNGAS, at other CND, we have referred to cannabis regulation as the elephant in the room, something that's obviously there but studiously avoided by governments. Uh, and we've been of the view that we should acknowledge it and we should explore what the options are for aligning domestic policy changes that are happening with international law. The idea of ignoring it in the hopes that the elephant just disappears is unlikely, and more likely that more elephants will be showing up in that room. So without further ado, I'll just say uh, the, who our speakers are, the order, and then hand it directly to them. So we'll begin with Annette Henry of Jamaica's Cannabis Licensing Authority, uh, then go to Dave Gooley taylor of the Global Drug Policy Observatory at Swansea University, UK, and then to Martin Jeltsma of the Transnational Institute in the Netherlands, and then finally to Alan Taylor at the University of Washington School of Law. I'll say a little bit more about Alan now in the introduction um, because her title doesn't necessarily convey it. She is affiliate professor of law at University of Washington School of Law and was previously professor of international law at Georgetown Law Center Prior to joining academia, she was a legal advisor at the World Health Organization, representing the organization at a number of treaty negotiations, and served as le senior legal counsel for the negotiation of WHO's first treaty, the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control. So without further ado, we'll go to Annette. Thank you very much, John. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Chairman of the Cannabis Licensing Authority and the Chief Executive Officer, please accept our appreciation to the Washington Office and Latin America the sponsors of this side event for allowing me and by extension the authority to briefly remind you of the legal and regulatory framework under which we are operating and to speak to you also on some other amendments to our Dangerous Drug Act. I would also like to acknowledge Ms. Lisson Salmon, she is the first secretary permanent mission in Geneva. She's also in the room. The Cannabis Licensing Authority was established under the Dangerous Drugs Amendment Act in 2015 for the purpose of enabling the establishment of a lawful regulated industry in hemp and ganja for medical, therapeutic, or scientific purposes. As per the amendments, the Cannabis Licensing Authority, and I will use authority after, shall have the power to make with the approval of the Minister responsible for justice, regulations for the issue and regulation of such licenses, permits, authorization, as may be appropriate for the handling of hemp, ganja for the medical purposes within the context of the law. The duty to ensure that regulations made under the law do not contravene Jamaica's international obligations, and such other powers, functions, and duties that may be assigned to the authority from time to time. On the 5th of May, 2016, the Minister of Justice and the Chairman of the Cannabis Licensing Authority approved the Dangerous Drugs Cannabis Interim Regulations 2016, and the main purpose of those regulations was to set up a framework for the handling of ganja for medical and therapeutic and scientific purposes. The authority, based on its mandate, did not waste any time. And in June 2016, we started accepting applications for the various license types. As of February 2018, the authority has received over 300 applications which are being processed. 
Some have been conditionally approved and licenses have been issued in respect of the different license types. As the medical industry takes place in Jamaica, a community-based sustainable alternative development plan to transition small traditional farmers from the illicit market to the licit regulated market is being finalized. The five categories of ganja licenses that the CLA is responsible for are for cultivator, processing, research and development, retail and transportation. The, the Dangerous Drug Act also <laughs> allows for other things to happen in Jamaica. It allows for the possession of ganja for religious purposes as a sacrament in adherence to the Rastafarian faith. The decriminal decriminalization of possession of two ounces of ganja or less to a ticketable offense. The person shall not be liable to be arrested or detained, therefore, but shall be liable to a fixed penalty. The law also requires persons suspected of being dependent on ganja to be referred for counseling and or rehabilitation. Like tobacco, smoking ganja in or within five meters of a public space is illegal, with the penalty being restricted to a crime. These matters, though not within the remit of the authority, they are part of our legal framework and current realities of Jamaica. And it is along that line, I would want to quote my colleague, when she delivered um, the Jamaica statement to the 61st session of the Commission on Narcotics Drugs on 13 March 2018, Ms. Lisa Salmon, First Secretary. I think those points are relevant, and I will, re I will restate some of these at this side event, and I quote, Jamaica reaffirms its commitment to its obligations under the three international drug control treaties and other applicable international law. Nonetheless, we maintain that the current international drug control architecture does not allow for the requisite policy space to design appropriate domestic policies suited to changing national realities, such as consideration of cultural perspectives and practices safeguarding of the right to freedom of religion and considerations for human development of our citizens, in keeping with SDGs and 16 in particular. Ladies and gentlemen, it is indeed an opportunity that we have been invited and I was provided to share with you the current realities in Jamaica with respect to the medicinal industry and for you to also have a better appreciation of the other realities of Jamaica. I thank you very much. Thank you, John. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's good to see you all here today. So we've just heard about um, what's going on at the national level, particularly in Jamaica here. And Annette um, made some mention of the tensions emerging around the need for the development of policy space at the national level. And I think um, if we begin on the premise that all international regimes, including um, lots of different uh, issue areas, need to evolve to accommodate the changing circumstances and ultimately survive, we would agree, I think, that that's not a particularly controversial uh, view and position. And our regime, the International Drug Control Regime, clearly has the capacity to evolve. And in the report, we talk about these evolution processes taking place in the operating and normative systems within the regime and how that links with the flexibilities, the inbuilt flexibilities within the hard law of the regime framework. Now, that said, I think as we all know, certainly if you've been here over the last couple of years and hear, heard statements from various countries, and particularly the INCB, there's a general consensus that this flexibility is finite and limited. And as you'll see in the report, we think there's a good case to be made that uh, the particular mechanisms and structures within the regime restrict, restrict options, they limit options for substantive change. And indeed, as part of this process we, um, of, of the report production, we engage with international lawyers from a variety of field, fields, and an international lawyer from another field, nothing to do with drug policy, upon looking at our regime, if I can call it that, uh, saw the drug treaties as a Jurassic system, one that almost seems frozen in time. And this Jurassic nature and the internal mechanisms 
we think does much to limit avenues for modernization, if we want to use that term, and in fact forces states to consider extraordinary measures. And I think we can see this in recent years in the case of uh, Bolivia and the coca leaf. As you know, the, the process was withdrawn with reaccession of the reservation. And also, um, in a far less satisfactory way, what might be called, and indeed we've called it in the report, un untidy legal justification. So here really we're looking at uh, Uruguay and the US federal government, although of course there's very different circumstances there, but both in this case, as you know, in relation to cannabis. So I think as well, while sometimes adopting what we might want to call a somewhat ambiguous position vis-a-vis uh, -vis treaty obligations might be politically practical for states, this is obviously far from ideal and probably not particularly sustainable. And we talk about this briefly in the paper, this notion of some sort of holding position through an approach that we call respectful temporary non-compliance. But ultimately, um, the conclusion is that international law is hugely important. And ignoring it or fudging it is not good for both our regime, the international drug control regime, or the international law system more widely. And bearing in mind what is going on in states around the world, and again, we give an overview with regard to the emerging tensions or existing tensions and deepening tensions between cannabis and international treaties. The question for us all then is to how best manage this process of change within the parameters of international law. So among a number of options not requiring um, consensus, not needing consensus, what we're doing in the report is offering a model that we feel has a number of clear advantages over other options, not least the fact that it provides a useful safety valve for collective act action to adjust a treaty regime that is, as I said, arguably um, frozen in time. So it's a complicated issue, and what we want to do here today to accompany the report is try to pose uh, an approach, not a solution, an approach, because what we're doing here is managing this complicated issue. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. And now we turn to Martin. Thank you, John. Uh, yes, and my task is to go a little bit into the more legal um, details of uh, the approach that, that uh, we think is worth um, to at least uh, yeah, some, uh, worthwhile to, to, for some serious considerations. Um, we, we don't com come up with this idea um, out of the blue, no? we, we, we have brought together uh, uh, a, a group of international lawyers to, to really help us think through what what would be viable options. Uh, you, you, you can see it in the report. It's also um, co-authored by by Margot Sheffitz Morris, which is uh, yeah, one of the the authorities about uh, the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties. Um, also, Moister has, has contributed to this report. He is the one who has written the, the handbook on, on the implementation of the 1988 Convention. Um, and, and behind it, the, the, there have been more international lawyers, including also Alan Taylor, um, <coughs> who, yeah, who we have brought together with help meetings to discuss and, and to really tease out whether this would be uh, a, a possible approach to take. So one of the options that, that came out of that process that we think should uh, be seriously considered is the one that is based on Article 41 of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, the inter se modification. Um, the, uh, one of the commentaries on, on the Vienna Law uh, of Treaties uh, describes the background to that interstate modification uh, as follows. No? Due to the conflicting interests prevailing at an international level, amendments of multilateral treaties, especially amendments of treaties with a large number of parties, prove to be an extremely difficult and cumbersome process. Sometimes an amendment seems even impossible. 
It may thus happen that some of the state's parties wish to modify the treaty as between themselves alone. Um, the, the International Law Commission, the UN uh, International Law Commission, has uh, discussed this matter after the, the treaty was, was um, adopted uh, in, in quite some detail. And yeah, they, they describe it as, um, yeah, the, uh, they've already yeah, referred to the, the safety involved. No, but it, the International Law Com Committee uh, Commission yeah, describes it as the a, a necessary um, clause to reconcile the need to safeguard, on the one hand, the stability of treaties with the requirement of peaceful change. That there has to be a possibility for change. The, the International Law Commission also talks about that it is a necessary article to avoid stagnation, as they referred yeah, to avoid that that international um, law becomes um, frozen in time. It has to be able to, to evolve. So, of course, um, it, it is a, an exceptional um, measure to take. So, also, the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties puts very specific conditions um, as to yeah, when, when it can and when it cannot be applied. And the most important conditions are it, 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 uh, an, an inter-se modification, so an agreement between a, a, a group, two or a group of, of countries to change the rules of the convention as between themselves alone, uh, can, cannot be allowed if it affects the rights of other parties of the treaty. And it cannot relate to uh, a provision derogation from which is incompatible with the effective execution of the object and purpose of the treaty as a whole. So th those are the two conditions that, that we have looked at in, in detail you know, uh, with, with the, the group of international lawyers to, yeah, to examine whether um, for this treaty regime it would be permissible under these conditions of, that are set by the Vienna Convention. Um, the, 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 one of the starting points for, for that analysis about the permissibility of, of inter modification is um, the, the nature of the treaties um, we are talking about. You know, the, the, the International Law Commission also makes a clear distinction between interdependent treaties, integral, absolute treaties, and, and yeah, but whether or not um, rights of other parties are affected, or um, whether the object and purpose of the treaty of, of, uh, as a whole is affected, depends a lot on the nature of the treaty. And, and, and a, a clear example of an interdependent treaty where, where you cannot have an intercept modification is uh, the, the agreement on the, the, the space station. Well, the, the, that's, that's an agreement, a, a treaty between 12 countries who uh, agree to together build a space station. And they all uh, agree to build, uh, to contribute specific elements. Um, so if one of the parties would not um, do comply with its obligations, the space station just would not function. So it, it would immediately um, yeah, um, make, make the execution of the treaty as a whole impossible. So that, that's, that's the easiest example of an interdependent treaty. An, an integral or absolute treaty, uh, yeah, several of the human rights uh, treaties you can describe like that, like the prohibition of torture has, has an absolute nature. So, yeah, a, a, a party to a uh, death convention can, cannot uh, sign an inter, inter say agreement that, uh, with some others that uh, some forms of, of torture um, are allowed among themselves. That, that's a, yeah, that kind of absolute principles. Um, the, 
but so looking then at the nature of the international drug control regime, you know, to, to what extent is it interdependent, absolute, or is it um, yeah, is it the kind of treaty that 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 does allow for a certain uh, deviation among the, the parties? Um, looking back at the origins of the control regime, um, not before the Second World War, the, 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 the basic starting point of the control logic behind the treaty system was to prevent the uncontrolled export of certain substances to states that have prohibited certain uses of those substances. It, it was clearly defined as it dependent on the, the, the jurisdiction of other countries. It, it, it asks countries to collaborate as much as possible to, to uh, the, the jurisdiction of other parties of the treaties. But it, it acknowledges that there are different um, jurisdictions with different um, uh, strictness in terms of <laughs> what kind of uses it, uh, are allowed. So the, the pre-World War II treaties also still talk about medical, scientific and other legitimate purposes which allowed for, yeah, for countries a certain flexibility to define what kind of other legitimate purposes um, could be allowed. And, and then again, the principle is that parties to the treaty respect those differences and, and collaborate as much as possible to prevent any trade to, um, yeah, to, to uh, jurisdictions that, that have applied a, a, a strict, um, more prohibitive uh, regime. Um, so, in, uh, yeah, in, in, the, in the paper we argue that um, the, the the, the nature of the regime no, is, is, is not comparable to like an absolute principle of prohibition because the, there are um, uh, yeah, se several psychoactive substances that, that are not controlled. It's not that the regime reflects an absolute principle of prohibiting all psychoactive substances. Um, it, it, it is also clear that it allows for certain exemptions for a specific substances. The 1971 Convention even has incorporated um, uh, the, 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 the principle of non-acceptance. At the moment of scheduling decisions, countries can um, apply that principle that they do not agree to the, uh, to the ma majority decision of the CMB to bring a specific substance under control. So, again, that is an example that exemptions for specific substances are considered possible within the regime. Um, of course, in, in daily practice in the world, there, there are in fact many examples of uh, different regimes that are coexisting um, um, uh, yeah, relatively peacefully. You know, there, there are a number of countries that, that do have a full prohibition of alcohol, for example, but also in, in the cases of substances like cats or, or, or kraton, you know, the, 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 those substances that are not under international control, the, yeah, the, there are at the national level yeah, some countries that, that maintain a full prohibition and, and others that, yeah, so it's um, it shows that differences in uh, control regimes are capable of um, coexisting um, in, in, um, in practice. So, the, yeah. in the report, the, yeah, we, we try to argue this in more detail and, and bring in the, 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 the legal arguments. And then we conclude that yeah, the possibility of interstate modification, well, it, it was specifically desi designed to find the balance between the stability of treaty regimes and the necessity of change. 
in absence of consensus. And, and I think in, uh, yeah, what we are seeing today is that uh, when it comes to cannabis, the consensus is going, is, is, is breaking apart. Um, so yeah, the, the, that necessity of change in the absence of consensus, that, that is exactly what were um, for, for which this interstate modification technique was, was designed. Um, the, the advantage of this more collective approach um, also would open the possibility of, of, of international trade between regulating uh, jurisdictions. And it also yeah, would enable small companies, farms in traditional sovereign uh, producing countries to start producing for uh, the, the, regulating, uh, the, the regulated illicit markets that are emerging. Um, so that, that is a clear advantage and that, that could also be applied to uh, thinking of, of the coca leaf, you know, where they have mentioned that the, well, Bolivia has, has a, uh, yeah, a national uh, now uh, reservation that, that makes it nationally um, legal to, to, to uh, have um, coca leaf in, in, in a natural form in the market, but it does not allow international export. So again, for that also the interstate uh, model could be used. But then, yeah, so we conclude that it is definitely worthwhile to consider this as, as an option to move forward and, and, and maintain respect for international law. But then, of course, the, the next big question is how how could this idea be um, uh, implemented in practice? Um, that's where we need you. <laughs> Maybe. Um, so I want to um, thank you all for spending your Friday afternoon um, in a packed audience um, here in Vienna to join this panel, and I'm sort of an honor it is to be here. I think my prior panelists have made a concrete legal, legal and political case for the codification of a treaty in per se to address the tension that exists between state regulation of cannabis and the legal commitment under the treaty system. And as Martin pointed out, dissatisfaction with the status of the cannabis in the treaty system has long resulted in what has been described as a quiet revolution. But today, this quiet revolution has been turned into an outright revolt. With more and more direct treaty violations, the tensions between state cannabis policy and international law can no longer be ignored. And the reality is that viable options to maintain the integrity of the treaty system are highly limited. You know, this week has shown us increasing polarization of policy debates here in Vienna. There is simply no political will to resolve the emerging and abundant challenges of cannabis legal reform within the treaty system at this time. In this scenario, the codification of a treaty inter se between two or more state parties is the only mechanism, and here's a word we or an expression we've heard a lot, the only safety valve available for collective action that can adjust the treaty regime for like-minded parties and at the same time preserve the rule of law. With more and more states modifying the legal status of cannabis in contravention of the treaty, the time is ripe. This is a, a term as international lawyers overuse, but the time is ripe for such states to use their sovereign authority to codify a new inter se treaty that is consistent with international law in order to maintain the integrity of the drug treaties and the legitimacy of state action. <clears throat> now my task for the next few minutes is not to make a further case for an inter se treaty, but to begin to discuss the processes that can be used by interested parties to advance negotiation of such an instrument and in particular, I want to talk about the contribution that civil society can make to strengthening this process and indeed perhaps even jumpstarting it. Of course, most of you understand that states, by virtue of their international legal personality, have the sovereign authority to negotiate virtually any treaty not in contravention of the UN Charter, including this proposed interstate treaty. Contemporary international lawmaking tends to be viewed as a process in which states with participation of non-state actors, formulate rules in accordance with agreed processes. Notably, the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties has very little to say about the process of treaty negotiation, 
As Martin pointed out, the Vienna Convention has only one rule on the negotiation that is applicable to interstate treaties. In particular, under Article 41, negotiating parties have a duty to notify other parties to the multilateral treaty of their intention to adopt an interstate notification. Though notably, this happened, um, is, uh, according to the commentary, rather late on in the process. Now, some further general guidance is provided by the UN General Assembly 99 negotiating principles, including the duty to negotiate in good faith. But outside these broad parameters, lawmaking can be conducted in any manner that the parties see fit. And there are a multitude of fora and designs for treaty negotiations. So in recognition of the variety of treaty processes that can be used, I wanted to focus on these early stages in the negotiation and the contribution that civil society can make to this process. As you know, the initiation of a legislative process is generally an unsystematic affair at the national level and even more so at the international level because of the decentralized nature of the process. During an hour after the stage in which interested parties begin to identify their desired goals through domestic policy processes, the, process, the parties will enter into a pre-negotiation phases of the if and how of negotiations. Now, in the course of pre-negotiations, parties will also begin, parties will also begin to identify common and separate interests and goals. And the subsequent negotiation phase consists of official meetings and informal meetings. Now, the development of an interstate treaty on cannabis raises novel and potentially highly complex substantive issues on which little exists to guide the policy-making process. And I only thought a few of the questions that could be included. For example, what should be the scope of this treaty? Should it be simply disapply the scheduling system of the drug treaties with respect to cannabis, or should it address other issues, such as medical cannabis, and the stringent requirements of the state medical cannabis systems um, in the single convention that a number of countries are in violation of, including my own? Um, should the treaty be broadly drafted to allow states maximum autonomy to regulate cannabis according to domestic policy preferences? Or should it include some international controls and commitments? And if so, what should those controls and commitments be? You know, one of the standard commitments you'll see in a public health instrument is some duty of public education, right, for state parties. Is that appropriate here? What other kinds of commitments? Um, should the treaty authorize international trade in cannabis amongst the parties to the treaties? This will be decided by the states. But if it does authorize such international trade, how should it be done? What legal mechanisms and controls can be included in the treaty to assure other states that states that are more moving outside the current legal regime will continue to honor other states' domestic prohibition on cannabis? And whether or not the treaty incorporates an international trade regime, what mechanisms can and should be included in the treaty to control the potential diver diversion of cannabis into illicit international channels? Now, in addition to the complex substantive issues, there are a host of legal procedural mechanisms that will need to be considered de novo. For example, should there be duties of international cooperation and information exchange to guide future policy development? And if so, what should be the, you know, the scope and the extent of such information? So clearly, the development of this interstate treaty, and these are just a few of the, the questions that are going to arise raises novel and potentially highly complex substantive and perhaps procedural issues on which little exists to guide policy making, uh, the policy making process. And I think this lack of information on these issues could be a major barrier to um, policy development and treaty codification. But non-state actors, civil society, um, including academic institutions, can help fill this vacuum. As we all know, non-state actors are important and even an central component of the most treaty-making processes today, both within and outside of the framework of the UN. Their participation yields political, technical, and informational benefit for states. And participation, importantly, can be structured to secure those benefits for states while maintaining real limits on NGO activities and power, and thereby preserving the sovereign authority of countries. Now, one of the prime contributions of NGOs in your national lawmaking process is policy research and development. And I think that this contribution will be dis, um, essential in the early stages of the development of the Interstate Cannabis Treaty, when state policy positions are just beginning to be developed. As in the case of other areas of legal concern, the drug control field includes expertly staffed NGOs and academic centers 
could devote considerable efforts and resources to policy research and have substantial expertise into drug policy. And these organizations include, among others, the Transnational Institute, the Washington Office on Latin America, and the Global Drug um, Policy Observatory at Swansea University in the UK. By involving these organizations and others in the process of developing a cannabis treaty, governments may be able to gain accurate and creative policy advice from independent sources that can advance the, effect, the efficacy and um, effectively lower the cost of treaty negotiations. Now, when I was a legal advisor at WHO, I was involved in several legal processes in which NGOs made substantial contribution in honing the treaty-making process very early on in the process. One such example is the WHO Framework Convention on Tobacco, which was the first treaty ever negotiated at WHO. This process was initiated by public hearings in which NGOs participated and provided substantive ideas, some of which were debated during the negotiation process. And during the formal negotiations themselves, the NGOs continued to provide policy input and advocacy for the treaty. But notably, as states move towards the final stages of negotiation and fixed positions, NGO formal participation became increasingly narrow. And that's consistent with what we see in other treaty-making processes. I think another interesting and pertinent example is the negotiation of WHO Global Code of Practice on the International Recruitment of Health Personnel. That's quite a mouthful. That was adopted in 2010. Now, although the negotiations of the Global Code had been um, authorized by the World Health Assembly many years earlier, the process remained dormant until it was launched by an initiative spearheaded by the non-state actor Realizing Rights, which was led by the Honorable Mary Robinson. What Realizing Rights did was convene a number of sessions of a graded Global Policy Council cons consisting of key interested states and representatives of international organizations and other non-state actors to begin the policy dialogue on the content of the proposed code. And this process essentially served to kickstart the formal negotiations. And I think the experience of these two very different policy processes point to several critical roles that NGOs could play in the process of negotiating an interstate cannabis treaty. First, I keep repeating it, NGOs can provide substantive policy research in the legal process. But also, at the early stages in the lawmaking process, major independent um, NGOs can utilize their convening authority to bring together interested parties to discuss the contours and the policy process for codifying an interstate agreement, an interstate agreement. And I think this convening role could play a critical role in the early stages of the process. The reality is, and this is no surprise, is that cannabis reform is a highly um, um, controversial issue. Um, a number of states are moving ahead domestically on this topic, including the Netherlands, Canada, Switzerland, Uruguay, Morocco, and Jamaica, among others. And there are a number of other countries that would be interested in domestic reform, but are deterred by the international legal status of cannabis. All of these states may be interested in changing the legal status of cannabis at the global level, but none of them will confine, um, may be able to find taking the political lead either um, feasible or palatable. So in this scenario, the creation of an independent forum can relieve the political pressure on interested states to take a lead, providing, providing a neutral platform for all interested parties to meet and to discuss. Now, further on in this process, NGOs can potentially also move the process along by creating different types of draft documents. Of course, the most complicated and diverse stage of treaty -making pro the treaty-making process is formulating of instruments. And this may involve several sub-stages, including preliminary studies, particularly, particularly in technically complex fields, but then you can include cannabis um, among these, and the preparation of initial drafts. And I think non-state actors can help at all stages of this process. For example, one such document that NGOs could potentially draft is what I call the elements document. In the early days of the pre-negotiation of the Framework Convention on Tobacco Control, one of the documents we created in the Secretariat, because it was a UN process, was what we call the, uh, the, the elements of a framework convention on tobacco control. And it, was, and it included all of the possible ideas, everything and the kitchen sink, that could be included in the framework convention. Such a document, I mean, could really help launch the discussions within WHO, and I think such a document can be very helpful for states to kickstart negotiation and discussion of a novel interstate agreement. Further on in the process, um, non-state actors can also potentially create draft texts 
at the direction of course and control of states. So to sum up, Nazi actors can play central in supporting states and facilitating the development, the codification of a new interstate treaty outside of the UN system. The reforms happening on a, at the increasing pace in states today means that there's this unique window of opportunity to resolve this legal dilemma. The time is right to create a new interstate treaty. Sovereign states ultimately will be the creators of a new interstate agreement, but they can do so in a manner strengthened by the contributions of civil society. Ultimately, the benefits that states will accrue from civil, um, civil society participation will allow them to regulate cannabis with greater efficiency, effectiveness, legality, and ultimately legitimacy. Thank you. I want to thank the panelists for covering an enormous uh, amount of territory um, with admirable brevity because it's such a complicated topic. Um, that said, we, we only have this room for another 10 or maximum 15 minutes. So let us open to questions. Um, please raise your hand to make sure that you're recognized. And I think given the amount of time, we'll try to go for a couple of rounds. Uh, hearing a few questions, going back to the panel, and then again. Um, and Please, a show of hands. Unless, unless we've already resolved it all and there are no questions. Michael? Yeah, I'm Michael Kravitz, uh, Veterans for Medical Cannabis Access. Um, with uh, the NGOs that we're working with right now, uh, well, first let me thank the panel. This is a wonderful presentation and the academic quality of the work I think is wonderful and up to the standard that we come to expect from these type of collaborations, which is just fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, the NGOs that we're working with in the uh, World Health Organization uh, cannabis review process, um, if I may be able to ask you to think of a hypothetical example of maybe a, a very strong recommendation that might come from WHO, um, how would that influence this process? Very good question, Anna. I don't see any other hands up, so we can go right to the panel, or we have another question here. Uh, hello, Merton Clark, Fields of Green for All, South Africa. Um, in South Africa, we have uh, 90,000 cannabis farmers who support 3 million marginalized rural poor people. We are the only NGO uh, in Southern Africa doing work on cannabis law reform. We've been doing this for eight years, and I'd just like to ask the panel how the higher level NGOs can help us who are working on the ground because we are totally self-funded. We sold weed in order to come to Vienna. So uh, we've been trying to do this for um, eight years now and we keep hitting a brick wall because we either get told that cannabis legalization is a done deal or we get told uh, that we're not important enough. So um, I'd just like to know, uh, thank you with respect for an amazing panel, um, what us smaller grassroots level people can do about this situation. Uh, I'm a little bit far of a microphone, but I hope my voice is strong enough to cover the room. Uh, one of the panelists uh, describes the situation as frozen in. In fact, it is. And we have here in Austria saying the normative power of facts. And I think we are just in this situation. We all realized what had happened. We also realized that despite the enormous amount of money which has spent it over the years, and the outcome is very, very poor. So it is time to act, to analyze the new situation, which is, and it depends who of the NGOs or any other body is uh, the first one who throws the stone into the pond. They were my statement. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see, we have one other hand up, and I think, or two, and then we should go to the panel. Um, actually, I have a question that's a little um, unrelated to treaties, so I'll wait and see if there's time later. Sir? 
I have just a question to your model. Would it be, uh, I didn't understand, uh, how is this new treaty linked to the UN? I didn't understand this. So, let's begin with Martin. Yeah, let me start with the, the WHO, the expert committee review process, because indeed that, that is, of course, a very relevant uh, question. Um, it, um, now we, we are extremely pleased that, that the expert committee is finally uh, taking up a, a pre-review of, of all cannabis-related substances. Well, in June, that they have a meeting, and, and, yeah, and we expect fully that it will conclude to proceed to a critical review. Um, and and uh, yeah, then indeed the question is what, what could potentially come out of it. Um, I, I think that um, one of the issues that, that the expert committee um, will address is also the, the confusion and the inconsistencies around the, the different definitions that are currently in, in use under the, the two treaties for, for cannabis. Um, because yeah, the, that, that creates a lot of confusion, even in, in the ICD um, uh, reporting system, you know, whether, whether, whether or not the law is uh, synthetic or can be derived from, or is it an extract uh, from, from the plant. And the, the, the definition also of, of cannabis um, in, in the 61 Convention is just the, the, the flowering buds, you know, the buds which leads in here in Austria, for example, that, that's just 500 meters from, from the UN building. You, you, you can have, you can see full uh, cannabis growing operations um, because until the flowering buds appear uh, here, here in Austria, it's the trade in cannabis plants is completely legal. Uh, so, uh, yeah. The, the, the expert committee will also deal with those kinds of inconsistencies, um, but it, it is of course uh, clear that there, there is not a single serious researcher at the moment that would still justify the inclusion of, of any cannabis related substance in Schedule 4, of the, uh, because medical use is, is spreading uh, quite rapidly. But I think it, uh, that, that yeah, the experts of the WHO will also find it quite difficult to, to justify the, still the inclusion in Schedule 1. And then, of course, if indeed the, they would recommend to take it also out of Schedule 1, then I think that, that, that there will be a huge political issue, which I suspect the CMD will not be able to resolve, but it will give uh, a very good argument for those countries uh, to, to basically apply that recommendation of the WHO among themselves. <coughs> there are other questions to panelists want to respond. Um, <coughs> anyway, I have two I wanted to respond to. First of all, how is this treaty Link to the United Nations. I mean, first of all, it should not be a formal UN treaty. I think it's Article 62. I don't have a, a photographic memory of the UN Charter in my head. I think it's Article 62 that authorizes the Economic and Social Council um, to recommend um, the option of instruments to solve economic and social problems. And we're talking about an instrument that will involve a few parties to begin with. But remember, this there's freedom of contract the state parties to the treaties. So you can include connection um, with um, the UN at each and every stage of the process, including the informal and formal negotiations. The treaty can actually formally include um, uh, connections um, with um, UNODC, for example, on information exchange. It really will depend on what the states prefer. Um, I also, is that, is that helpful? Okay, I also wanted to respond um, to the grassroots um, or, or, um, question. I, you know, I don't know enough about the drug controls the world, but I will tell you what happened in tobacco, which is maybe a very interesting model for you. So when we began to negotiate the framework convention on tobacco control, there was no international tobacco control non-state actor. All there were were 
you know, um, larger and smaller national level actors, which, which so I'm side of creating sort of unique WHO legal firms really put um, small actors at a disadvantage. And one of the things that they did was create what's called the Framework Convention Alliance. And this was actually spearheaded by Tobacco Free Kids in the U.S. Tobacco Free Kids was like one of the largest national um, NGOs and had um, a lot of money from, I actually don't remember who, but one of the foundations in the U.S. And it created the Framework Convention Alliance, which now consists of over 300 non-state actors who coalesce together and work on tobacco control. And during the negotiations, what that helped do is it helped provide a forum for non-state actors to try to come to their own one position of what policy should be, which by the way is not a pretty process. It's like you don't want to see the making of a sausage, right? The, the process like, you know, of, of developing policy positions on different um, and different areas and speaking in one voice. So that's one avenue that's been explored. And at the same time, they were able to get funding to help provide support to the to the smaller non-state actors. Um, but if you're interested in pursuing that, you may want to talk to Tobacco Free Kids for their international section to find out how they do that. I'm mindful that we're at two o'clock and mindful of our obligations to third parties, um, which is the group coming in uh, after us, um, which has an event at 2.20. That said, if people have a very quick comment or question that we can reply to quickly, we could do that right now. And if not, I'll just um, make some concluding remarks. So if there's a, a flash show of hand um, that we could respond to quickly. Hello, hello, everybody. Uh, Farid Gewesh. Uh, I would just raise a question, not about cannabis, but is this interse uh, could be a way for EU to negotiate with uh, some Latin America country to provide a way for the local farmers to have uh, access to other market for their products? Uh, concretely, is the interse a possibility to import in France uh, coca tea? To make it. Uh, yes, that, that would definitely be a possibility. Now, in, in, yeah, we are also uh, yeah, look, looking at, for example, um, uh, Moroccan hash for, for the, the Dutch coffee shops. No, it, it's a part uh, of, the, of the sales in, in the Dutch coffee shop system. That, that cannot be easily re replaced by domestic cultivation. So, yeah, it, it, it is not easy to, um, to continue with mm, uh, completely closed national regulation systems. Uh, but, yeah, because you know, consumer preferences, etc., yeah, the international trade is, is an important part of the cannabis market. And, yeah, and, and the, the same, um, yeah. It, it, could also well to, to Coca Cola, for example. Uh, I would say absolutely. But you need to keep in mind that the science that matters in lawmaking is political science. And while there may be some ideas that are really good policy, ultimately this is a sovereign process, and it will be it will be the decision of the states that negotiate it. You know, all that non-state actors can do is make the case for it, but it's ultimately a sovereign decision. So on that note, I, I want to thank again our panelists. I want to thank you all for participating uh, and coming. And I want to invite everybody who's here and others who they may talk to about this idea and our report in particular to provide feedback and questions. I think this report doesn't, doesn't mark the end of something. It's really the beginning of a story of, is this feasible? Um, and if so, how might it work out? And I want to reflect on the field of Green's question in that respect as well, knowing not much about your reality. I think if an instrument like this is created, it is an open instrument that allows other countries to adhere and provides that safety valve for countries that doesn't exist right now. And I think that's this is not something that would remain limited to two, two or three. It's something that could open the door to other countries who are struggling with the misfit between what the treaties require and their, and their reality. So I think uh, we're, at, we're just at the opening of this story and we, we really um, would love to have your feedback and continue the conversation. So thanks to all of our panelists who came from very far.
Um, and thanks to all of you.